I, um, I love uh, coming to worship at this church. I love being in, uh, in this place. I love uh, pastors John and Debbie. They're amazing people. And they have that commodity. I mentioned this at conference, but they have that commodity that we're all looking for. And that is consistency over the long arc. And so can we just honor them again today for the way they, the way they continue to lead and build and the way they've been faithful. Last night, I just sensed God shifting focus for me. And I want to speak to somebody today who feels like life is crushing you. Let's just take a little quick poll. How many feel like, and, and you're not going to want to raise your hand, but please do. How many of you feel like you're crushing life right now? Show of hands. Th thank you. One person. Two. Okay, that was a thumbs up. Okay, three people. Okay, so that wasn't the right question. Let me rephrase the question. How many of you feel like things are going good in your world right now? Show of hands. Really high. Great. How many of you would consider yourself to be more in the neutral zone? Not, not, not like things are off the chart, but things aren't really in the tank either. We're just kind of cruising. Neutral zone. Okay. How many of you would say, honestly, in front of the people in your row, I feel like I am in one of the low seasons of life right now. Can I see your hand? Okay, that's who this message is for. And if you're in a high season, this message is also for you because you know someone in a low season. And maybe you haven't known exactly what to say to them. Well, after today, you're going to know exactly what to say to them. And I'm also working on, because last night as I was working on this talk, I realized that I've never heard a message in church for what you do when you're in a great season of life. Every message is how you make it through the hard time, how you make it through the valley, how you come through the storm, how you overcome the difficulty, how you're not going to be defined by your defeats. Those are the messages we hear. But then you got a guy, you know, who just sold Bitcoin at the right place and he's got a million bucks in the bank that he didn't have yesterday. His kid just graduated from high school who he didn't think was going to make it through the ninth grade and he's feeling great about life. No one's ever preached a message to that guy. Here's what you do when God gives you the grace of abundance. So I'm going to work on that talk. I will come back and share that talk at some point for all the people that are just flying as high as you can fly right now. But today, God wants to speak to somebody who feels like life is crushing you. And I don't know who you are, but I do know that God knows who you are enough to kind of rattle me out of the lane I was in and put me in your lane today. And the text is coming from Genesis chapter 16, a story that many of us are very familiar with. And the story is a story of promise. God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of a mighty nation. Now, this was obviously a setup for God because Abraham was old and his wife couldn't have kids. So this was a God moment from the beginning. But Abraham, who's called Abram at this point, and Sarah, who's called Sari at this point, decided they take a shortcut. God's not coming through, so we're going to have to come through. Have you ever been there? God's not going to work it out, so I'm going to need to work it out. And so Sari goes to Abram with this plan, hey, I have this servant, Hagar, and I'll let you be with her. And she'll be the way that God answers this prayer. And so this is where we are in the story. Pick it up, if you will, in verse 4. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sari said to Abraham, You are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. 
And then he responds, your servant, Hagar, is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sari mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. Anybody feel like that's where you are today? Circumstances went sideways. Things started happening in your life that you didn't have control over. Things have been done. Things have been said. You've been mistreated. Times got hard enough that you actually now feel like you're alone on the run in the desert and that nobody understands what it feels like to you that life is crushing you. I want you to notice, though, where she was. She was in, in the desert by a spring. It was the spring beside the road to Shur. Now, that's just a little, I think, you know, one of those God things in the text. I don't think there's any, like, play on words here. It's S-H-U-R. It's a place, the road to Shur. But if you feel like you're in the middle of the desert today, the first thing God's saying to you is read it right in the text. Maybe it feels like you're out in the middle of nowhere by yourself, but you're, you're on the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sari, where have you come from and where are you going? Some of you are asking that question today. You're like, I don't know where I'm coming from. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what is up. I don't know what is down. I don't know what's left. I don't know what's right. I don't know how I got here and I don't know how I'm getting out of here. Anybody today that that's kind of where your reality is? That's where Hagar was. And this angel asked her, where, where did you come from? And where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Siri answered. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. This was amazing news, by the way. No knock on the daughters, but this was an incredible word because it meant that Hagar was going to have a possibility of a future. And you'll name him Ishmael. That name means the Lord hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. Now the downside is he will be like a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone. And everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward his brothers. But when you're in the condition that Hagar was in... You're really leaning into the good news. I'm having a son. I got an angel talking to me. Th th things are at least trending upward. Oh, he's going to be a, a donkey of a man. Okay, well, we'll work that out. And I'm sure in her mind she was thinking, well, I can help him with all that. So she's positive. So look what happens in verse 13. And, and, and we know this verse, but I want you to see the wonder of this today. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. A servant girl who's in a story because God's chosen people took a shortcut because they weren't willing to wait God out. Now consequences are falling on to other people and now we're in the middle of a desert with a woman who's gonna have a son alone being encouraged to go back to the mistress who had mistreated her, and yet something powerful has happened, and that person, not the best person in town, not the person with the greatest story in town, not the person that understood all of what God was doing in town, but that person, Hagar, she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. Quote, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. El Roy, the God who sees me. If you feel like life is crushing you today, 
I want to encourage you with five things. Number one, God sees you. You may not think anyone else sees you. You may feel invisible in the world around you. Like Hagar, you may be in that place, but she discovered in that moment as God sent an angel into her situation, oh my word, the God of heaven sees me. And then she had the privilege of giving for all of us a name to God, revealing a name of God. One of his names is El Roy, the God who sees me. And people in your family may not see you. People may not get it. People may be looking at you like, hey, it's going to work out, or don't worry about it, or we'll pray for you. And like, no, you're not understanding what's going on with me right now. Maybe people at your work don't get it. You don't think they see you. But God, the God of heaven, his name is El Roy. And today, wherever you are and whatever circumstance you are in, God Almighty Yahweh sees you. El Roy has his eyes on you. And more than that, number two, God knows everything about your situation. So when we get in one of these low spots, a lot of times we'll be with a friend and someone will ask us, well, tell me what's going on. And then we tell them the story. And you know, some of them are complicated and you say, Hey, it's going to take a minute. You have, do you have, you really have time? Cause it's going to take me about two hours to unpack all this. And then we tell them the whole story. I'm just going to go back to the beginning. When, when I was three, we lived in Tennessee. And then they just start rolling you all the way up to the present so that you can be locked in on the story. But when El Roy came to Hagar on the road to Shur, he already knew the story. You're pregnant and you're going to have, you don't know this yet, a son. And you haven't decided what you're going to name him because you don't know you're having a boy yet. His name is going to be Ishmael, which means God hears because the Lord God has heard your cry. God knew more about her situation than she knew about her situation. And I want you to know today, if you feel like life is crushing you, God knows everything about your situation. I'm thinking about that woman at the well as Jesus went through Samaria. And as they were talking, he said, go get your husband. Everyone knows this story. And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, well, that's true that you say you don't have a husband. You had five husbands. And he probably said, you know, there was William and then there was Josh and then there was Tom. And he goes through the whole thing. And he said, oh, and by the way, the guy you're with right now, not your husband. He knew more about her situation than she did. And so if you feel today like God doesn't see you, A, he does see you, but here's what's the bigger story. If you start at the beginning and tell your whole story till the end, you still don't know what God knows. He knows more about your story right now than you do. And he knows more about your situation. The third thing he wants you to know today is that God is working on your situation and he's working in your situation right now. Right this second, he's working on your situation and in your situation. You're like, well, I don't see it. Well, no duh. I mean, we don't see a lot. We, we should be asking God more and more what Paul was asking for, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Because we go through life, you know, with 2020 or 2030 or 2040 or whatever you got going on, and we don't even see a lot of stuff in life. Like, I never saw that car. Anybody said that this week? I don't know what happened. I was coming out of Target, and I didn't see him. <laughs> we don't see a lot in the natural we surely don't see as much as we could in the spirit, but in the spirit and in the natural right now, God's working on your story. Even though you may not see it, God is working on your story and in your story right now. 
I was thinking last night when I was praying through this, and I'd never thought this before, about Jesus going to the cross. And we know he was carrying this big cross beam and eventually out of fatigue and weakness, he stumbles and they pull someone out of the crowd to carry the beam. But there, there were other guys going to the hill of crucifixion also. And so there's many people, we don't know how many, we know there was a thief on the left and a thief on the right, but we, we don't know how many more people were on the way to crucifixion that day. But as Jesus was in the mix of the people going to die, he was dying for the people that were going to die. And one of the guys going to die that day, and maybe he could carry his beam, maybe he hadn't been flogged and he hadn't been beaten up and he hadn't been treated the way Jesus had all through the night and maybe he's making it to the thing and he's thinking, these, these are my last few minutes on planet earth before I'm nailed to this beam I'm carrying. And walking on the road with him is Jesus. And Jesus, in a couple of hours, is going to save him from a life of sin and welcome him into paradise with Almighty God. Jesus is working on his story and in his story as they're walking to Calvary. So that when he says, remember me, when you come in your kingdom, Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. You may not see it right now, but trust me, the son of suffering, triumphant in resurrection is in your story right now. And he is working on it and he's working in it. So yes, call somebody. Yes, reach out for help. Yes, have a trusted circle around you. But the God of heaven is at work. The God of heaven is on board. The God of heaven is involved. The God of heaven is moving things. The God of heaven is working situations. The God of heaven is working right now in and on your story. The fourth thing is this, God is greater. Period. Point number four. There was a monster truck in the arena. <laughs> the mission of the truck was to instantaneously go from zero to a hundred. Up a dirt ramp over two vehicles in the air, land and stop feet from the stage. Stronger men. So they positioned the guests on the front row. where the truck would go airborne, <laughs> land, immediately have to hit the brakes, which they had told us ahead of time, meaning the axle or the differential could snap. It's no worries, the tires are this tall and this wide. I've never been to a monster truck event before. I've never been to a lot of things before that happened at Stronger Men's Conference. And so I've never seen a monster truck that close before. And I was like checking things out. I'm not like super nervous about life, but I, you know, I, I observe things. And so I'm happy uh, that they've gotten those concrete barriers that they put along the interstate when they're working on a lane. They got those all the way down in front of the seats and they've got them all across the front of the stage and all over on the other side. I was like, huh, uh, in some meeting, they said we should get concrete barriers <laughs> in case. Do you know what a monster truck thinks of that two-foot concrete barrier? It goes, oh, look, a ramp. We can jump up into the lower section. So I'm 
I'm not really nervous about stuff. Somebody asked me later, like, were you scared? No, I, I don't get scared too easy about stuff, but I am a planner. And one thing I'm convinced of, I'm not going out underneath a monster truck. That is not gonna be the end of my story. So I start evaluating the situation, and I realize the two-foot concrete barrier is gonna do nothing. There's a, a railing in front of the front row of seats that's metal and about this high, and there's a, a, maybe a foot in between, and I said, that railing isn't gonna do anything. But I'm pretty nimble. And if anything goes squirrely, I'm going down in there, down here, underneath the concrete barrier and the rail. That's where I'm going. And the truck or the tire is going to go over the thing, up into there somewhere, and then I'm going to get up and pray for people. That's my plan. So that's what I'm going to do. Because I know if I'm down in there, no matter how big that thing is, I'm going to be okay. Because that big old tire can't get down in there. And I'm telling you, if you've been around church for a while, it's called the cleft of the rock. The bosom of Jesus. If you haven't been around church for a while, it's called being in Christ. The scripture says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they're safe. I'm going into my strong tower. And this thing, it could crush me, but there's no way it's crushing Jesus. And I am hidden with Christ in God. And God is greater. The last thing, the fifth thing, is I just want you to know, and I'm here to testify, that God will use your present situation in your future story for his glory. You're like, I don't like my present situation. Well, I, you know what? You can't change that, and nobody else can. You're in it. God can work in it. He, he could change it today. He might change it tomorrow. He might change it next week. We don't know how God works and when he works. He does miracles, and we don't know when he chooses to do this and that and the other. So your situation could change while I'm talking right now, or your situation could turn this way or that way. But I want you to know God's greater than it all. And I want you to know that more than that, God will use your present situation, even if you feel like life's crushing you, in your future story for his glory. It's going to happen. He's going to take where you are now and use it in a place you're going to be in the future to give you the opportunity to bring glory to the name above all names. God has never promised that he will explain everything to me on this side of heaven, but he has promised that he will use everything that comes against me for the good of heaven. A lot of you know my story. Um, 36 years old, my dad passed away. He'd been disabled for seven years. He was instantly disabled overnight. Brain virus. Never worked again, never drove a car again, never did art again, never played golf again, never dressed himself again. And for seven years, I'm in Texas with my wife doing ministry. My mom is in Atlanta taking care of my dad. And I'm asking God, can we go help mom take care of dad? And every time it's like, you stay where you are, stay where I have you, I'll take care of mom and dad. Finally, God says, you can go. And when he says we can go, we're like, we start making arrangements. We start shifting all the plans. We start getting ready to move from Texas to Atlanta. The day we end our ministry in Texas to come to Atlanta, the very day is the day that we buried my father 
outside Atlanta, Georgia. He died instantly, fell over of a heart attack on a Friday, unrelated to his seven years of disability. And here was Shelly and me in Atlanta, no job, no purpose, no ministry, no dad, confused, so frustrated, everything was foggy and cloudy. I was so mad. Not at God. I was mad at me because God said go in November. And I did what normal people do. I thought, oh, great, we'll end the spring semester, the school year, and then we'll go at the end of April. And I'm like, I missed it. If I'd gone in November, I'd got to be with my dad the last six months of his life. But now he's gone, and this whole tragic seven year journey has come to an end and I have no idea where we came from and I have no idea where we're going. I do not know how we got here and I don't know where we go from here. Then I was flying on a plane to speak at a youth event in Dallas a few months later in the middle of the summer and God met me on about row 22 sitting by the window and dropped a vision into my life that I did not see coming. And it was a vision of passion, what has become Passion Conference, 1995. The first one was in 1997. We did four up to the year 2000, did this massive event, thought that was the end of the vision, but God said, no, I want you to keep going. So all these years later, we're still gathering people, 18 to 25 year olds, for the glory of God. All out of that vision, out of the cloudiness, out of the frustration, out of the fog, out of the we don't know, out of the we made a huge mistake. God birthed something. So we're on our way to the Mercedes-Benz Stadium a few months ago for Passion 2022. Against every odd you can think of. We, we started planning in May because, you know, you can't plan stuff right now. We had no money because we'd refunded every ticket for every event in 2020 and 2021. We didn't know where the pandemic was going. People had migrated all over the country, so a lot of our contacts weren't even there anymore. But God said, go stand on your corner. We said, we will. And we made it to Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And the reason I'm sharing this story with you, some have read this in a book maybe, or heard me say it before, but this is one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful things that's ever happened to me in my life, and it's happened twice. The first time I didn't see it coming and it almost knocked me down. This time about six days before passion, somebody tipped me off because I wasn't seeing it because sometimes we don't see it. Just give you a little journey really quickly. So we started passion on Sunday night. On Thursday night, there was a college football game, the Peach Bowl, the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, as you can see, Pitt, Panthers, and the Michigan State Spartans. Got any fans of those schools in the place today? And so I took this picture on my television at home because I have COVID and I'm barely going to get cleared the day before the conference starts. And I'm at home and I'm watching the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. I take a photo. This game ends, they clear the field, clear the entire stadium, and they turn it over to our team. Somewhere around two, three, four in the morning, our team gets to the stadium. They immediately go to work. The first thing they do is they start putting this terraplast over the field. That left end there goes in first because that's where the stage frame and structure is going to be erected. There's no time to get the Michigan State off, so a lot of people sat on top of that. Pitts on the other end, we played music on top of that. The Chick fil A. Peach Bowl things in the middle, that all gets covered. And then passion happens. And on the last night of passion, I speak. And I speak from the B stage, which is that shard that's sticking out off of the main stage. And so I'm standing right at the 50 yard line. And I come down from the stands and I'm ready to go up at the end of the song and the stage manager standing there and I know that within a few bars of music I'm going to go up these six eight steps and step on and I have this message just burning in my heart for this night 
And as I'm going up the steps, it just blows me away again. Because I know I'm gonna give this message literally, not figuratively, standing five feet on top of one of the most beloved logos in America, the Chick-fil-A logo. You thought I was gonna say Andy's, but I'm literally preaching to the vision of summer of 95, standing five feet on top of a logo that they didn't have time to get off the field. So it's right there. The Chick-fil-A logo is right underneath my feet. A logo that my father, Louis Giglio, created in 1964. My dad created the Chick-fil-A logo. And there was no angel who appeared down at the bottom of the stairs with a headset and said, hey, by the way, right before you go up into your talk, I just want to download some stuff to you. I've got an iPad here. I've got some diagrams. Here's why your dad got sick. Here's why your prayers didn't get answered the way you thought. Here's why your dad had not one brain surgery, but two. Here's why your dad had a stroke. Here's why your dad went through this. Here's why your dad did this, 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 and this. Here's why the seven years. Here's why the hardship. Here's why the desert. Here's how, why you were out there by the road on the way to shore um, and never thought you were going to get there. Here's why you made the decision too late. Here's why you missed your dad's last six months. Here's, let me explain how all this is working out. I didn't get the download at the bottom of the stairs, but what I did get at the bottom of the stairs was El Roy. I see the God who sees me. And I went up those stairs and I could hear my heavenly father speaking into my heart saying, you go, son, you go, son, you do what I brought you here to do. You lead the way I've brought you here to lead. You share the word that I've given you to share tonight. I am with you. Heaven is with you. We are on your side. Your heavenly father, Jehovah God, El Roy sees you tonight. Do you see the God who sees you? Because even in the midst of when you didn't see it, I was working. And even though you couldn't feel it, I was working because I never stopped working. I never, ever stopped working. Tell any people, do you realize? Because you can't, I love this, because you can't say, what a coincidence. How many things had to happen for a dude to get to preach in a stadium on top of his dad's logo? How many things have to happen for that to happen. And I'm telling you, God is promising you right now, I will use your present situation in your future story for my glory. El Roy. I was 36 the day my dad was buried. I was 63 when I stood on that stage. And I'm here to testify. I wonder, is this word for anybody here today? Can I just see you? Somebody, is this word for somebody today? Could you just keep your hand up just for a minute if this word's for you today? All the way to the very last person, the very top row. Can we just open our hands to heaven? Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are not only the suffering servant, but you are the risen lamb. I pray that you would draw near in every low place, 
in every desert, in every hidden place, in every place where there's been accusation, there's been a pressure, there's been animosity, there's people who have been pushed out, fled away. I pray that you would draw near. I know that you do draw near to the brokenhearted and you're close to those who are crushed in spirit. I'm asking you simply to plant seeds of faith in deserts of doubt. That you would give the gift of faith that people will know beyond any doubt. God sees me. That's all I need today is to know that Yahweh sees me. Thank you, God, that you are working right now. Thank you that your astounding work isn't affirmed by feelings or sight. It is commended today by our faith, and we give you praise right now, even in the low, 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 because you are greater in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.